Welcome back to Ask the Compound, the show where you, the viewer, send us in the questions at askthecompoundnews at gmail.com. And I know I'm going to get emails today because anytime I wear a fresh striped sweater like this, someone wants to know where I got it. Feel free to email and ask. Well, where'd you get it? You can't just leave us hanging. People can ask later. Uh, today's show, we answer questions about Apple, Apple stock options. A new person working at Apple wants to know what to do with their stock options, the biggest risks in the market right now, and then we have a plethora of insurance questions we've been sitting on for a few weeks. People keep asking lots of insurance questions. We've got an expert there. Today's show is sponsored by Rocket Money. I look at Rocket Money app this morning on my phone, and I think one of the coolest features you can do is scroll through your upcoming bills. So you just, you just kind of scroll like tinder or something you're swiping and it's like wait i'm paying for that wait that costs how much and wait why am i being double charged for this it's kind of cool plus you can like look at what's coming up just because it's easier for stuff to slip through the cracks these days if you're paying with everything online or with your phone or with your bank your credit card it's easier to have bills slip through the cracks rocket money is a personal finance app that lets you find and cancel your unwanted subscriptions monitors your spending helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings i signed up today i said cancel go lower my internet bill for me they said give us a couple weeks we're going to try it so i'll report back Five million users on Rocket Money have saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members $740 a year when using all the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions. Go to rocketmoney.com slash ATC. We're trying to save you money. If you hate inflation, this is the way to do it. Rocketmoney.com slash ATC. Yeah, I actually, you can recommend uh, a service that they will negotiate for you. I oh. recommended one. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it on, on the show. But, but there's a company that I'm like, you know, I feel like I'm paying them too much. And I recommended to them in their, uh, in their app that they add them. Oh, okay. Feedback. I like it. Yeah. All right. That's what this show is all about. Let's do the first question. Okay. Up first today, we have a nice, short and sweet one. I love short questions. What's the biggest risk in the markets right now? That is short and sweet. We get some very long questions here. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to shorten them up a little bit because people love giving us information. This one is short and sweet. The simple answer here is the one everyone's been preparing for forever. It's probably for the last 24 months, I guess, the recession. So in the post-World War II era, the U.S. economy has gone into recession once every five years or so on average since 1945. But, John, give me a chart on here. Look at how much, look at how much more spaced out those recessions are in recent decades. So from the late 1940s through the early 1980s, there was a recession once every three and a half years. Since 1990, there's been one recession every nine years on average. And you can see that really, really thin gray bar, the, the most recent one. That was two months long for COVID, right? So technically, I don't know, that wasn't a normal part of the business cycle. It was definitely a recession. We reset and there was a new economic environment after that slowdown. And that was a really bad contraction and a lot of people lost their jobs. But it wasn't a normal part of the business cycle. So... Between the great financial crisis and that recession, it was 11 years. But if we, really, if we take that out for the normal business cycle, it's really been like 15 years since we've had a normal slowdown in the economy. So I don't know. It seems like that is the easiest thing that you could worry about because most of the time when there's a recession, earnings fall, the stock market falls. You can't line them up exactly because the stock market tends to fall before the recession and bottoms before the recession is over. I'm not willing to go out on a limb and predict there's going to be a recession this year because the economy still remains strong. But that has to be a risk up right up there for the markets. Uh, some would say inflation reaccelerating is a risk. I can see that if it means the Fed was forced to raise rates again. But supply chains are are fine these days. Duncan can get his hats in like two days now from Amazon. You don't have to wait for oh, his yeah, hats anymore. No problem. Yeah. Right. How many new hats do you get a year? Uh, a few. A few. I'm building up a collection. Yeah. Okay. Hats to you are sneakers to me. My wife always says that I have way too many shoes. Uh, you can never have too many hats. Okay. Uh, so, but I think if, if we did have inflation reaccelerate and people are saying it's already sticker than, than ever, that's because the economy is stronger. So I don't see that as being a big problem for the stock market unless inflation went really crazy again. That, that's probably bad news. But the least satisfying answer of all is just something that comes out of left field because the biggest risks are always the ones that you don't see coming. But by definition, you can't predict those in advance. So... I'm sure I could come up with some other micro or macro risks that, you know, interest rates or valuations or the Fed screwing something up. But the way that I see it, those are all the price. Th those risks are the price of admission when investing. You have to bank on those happening sometime, even though they don't happen all the time. So how is this, Duncan? The biggest risk for investors right now, as always, is you. The royal you. You mean literally me? Oh, okay. No. So it's like just the, the risk that you're going to make a really big mistake at the worst possible time. You get right. FOMO when things are doing too good. You get scared when things are doing too bad. 
Uh, you sell all of your stocks and you become paralyzed and don't get back in. So uh, the whole idea is that like risk comes in different forms for different people at different times and it never completely disappears. I don't care how you position your portfolio, uh, how, how often you hedge your Oatly stock. There's going to be a risk regardless of the stance you take. If you have too much cash, there's a risk. If you have too much stocks, there could be a risk. So Buffett once said that the risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. The way I look at it is like the best risk control you have is knowing what you own, why you own it, and how long you're going to own it for. So for, for every investor, the biggest risk is themselves. It's, it's making a bad decision at the worst possible time to screw up their investment plan. Everything else is temporary. Well, yeah, I, I was talking with you about this. And yeah, I think you're 100% right. But I, I was talking with you, you about this this morning. That I, I just I read all these finance books. I hear you guys talk all the time. We have all kinds of interesting guests on. I just like trying out different stuff, playing around in the market with my brokerage account, not my retirement, but with my brokerage account. And I, the one thing that feels like it doesn't work at all is the trend, the trend stuff. Because like I was telling you, it's like, oh, this stock looks good. It's going up. I buy it. It immediately goes down. Like literally You don't want to read charts, is that you're telling me? I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I've listened to JC more than a, a few times. I feel like well, here's, I, the, here's the hard part about that. Every strategy has its like there's always exceptions to the rules and there's always hard parts about every strategy. The only way a strategy like that works is if you sell very quickly when it goes down. If that's going to be your your you take a bunch of little a thousand cuts and then hopefully one of them goes up a lot. That's how it works. So every strategy has that where there's there's drawbacks like buy and hold is the worst investment strategy ever, except all the other ones. Right. I kind of stole that from Churchill. Ben Carlson, quote, Churchill, right? Like Mike on the office. It does feel, I'm, I'm a sucker for averaging down because, you know, it's like I liked it yesterday at this price, today it's cheaper. It okay, if you're averaging better. down, then you're, not a, then you're not a trend follower. See, that's the problem. Th this is a mistake is you're conflating two hybrid. different strategies. <laughs> I'm a hybrid. <laughs> yes, you can't have both. You have to do one or the other. Okay, good to know. All right, next question. Trading with Ben. Today's, right. today's episode of Trading with Ben. You don't want to uh, take my advice on trading, except don't okay. do it. <laughs> that, what did, uh, I, what did I say to you? I said, you're going to be happier one day when all your money is in index funds like me, and you won't have to worry about it. Yeah, one day. One day I'll, I'll grow up. Uh, so the first question was, by, uh, was from Janet, by the way. So Up next, we have a question from Drew. I'm starting my dream job at Apple, and with that comes a massive Congrats. change in compensation. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, and a not to brag. Uh, mainly in the form of large stock grants. I know I need to remember my training, keep my head down, sell the RSUs as they vest, and get them into index funds. But I also know psychology can be the hardest part of investing, and I've been surprised at how many of my friends and coworkers, basically everyone I've asked, have kept all of their RSUs in Apple. I know they're taking a huge risk, but it's paid off so far. Any suggestions for dealing with the FOMO? You once said it's okay to give up on hitting grand slams in exchange for not striking out at the plate. I have to admit it's tougher to settle for singles and doubles when everyone around you is hitting grand slams. Uh, I know it's a privileged question and I've already won the game, but temptation and social pressure are powerful forces. You're a big really on-base percentage guy, aren't you? I can, I can tell. Yeah, I, he, he's using my, uh, my own quote there. I like it. It's, this is a very good question. And so... You've, Duncan, have you read this one yet? Influenced by Robert Cialdini? No. Psychology of Persuasion. He gives these, these six things. This is from, I think he wrote it in the 80s or 90s. It's a classic. And one of the biggest points he makes about how to influence other people is social proof. And it's just the idea that actions are seen as more appropriate when other people are doing them. So in the book, he, he gives the example of why they used to use canned laughter on sitcoms. Which thankfully they don't do anymore. Did the office break that one? I think the office more or less broke that from happening of just not having the laughter in the background, the laugh track. Right. Yeah. But they did these studies and they found that the laugh track, people thought this stuff was funnier if there was a laugh track added, and they laughed more and harder at the jokes of the corniest and the worst jokes. So it's, it works, right? You get other people to laugh and they laugh with you. Well, and the origin was from an actual live audience being there watching. Yes, they used to. Recording. Yes, they used to have it. Yeah. But they they put it in there, and I'm glad they don't really do that anymore. Um, but I think there is a lot of social proof when it comes to financial decisions, right? When you get out of school, you should, your next thing you do after you get married is buy a house. Buying a house is always better than renting. Young investors should always have all their money in the stock market. This is why we have the keeping up with the Jones stuff. So the way that I look at this is it's not really an all or nothing decision. In most financial decisions, you want them to be black or white, yes or no, right or wrong. And most of them exist in a state of gray. So 
I think in something like this, you don't have to be the total indexer just because that seems like the easy way. If you want to hold on to some of those Apple stock options, go for it. Just set some boundaries in advance. Figure out a portion of them that's going to let you sleep at night, but also give you that option of, of earning some money. And unfortunately, starting at Apple now, the, the timing might not be the greatest. John, throw up the chart here. This is Apple over the past 10 years. It's up, oh, rounding up about 1,000% over the last 10 years, 27% annualized returns. Just insane. So Drew probably is coming into Apple at a time when a ton of the employee, current employees have gotten really, really rich if they had all their money in it. I'm not saying Apple's going to go on to crash or underperform from here or whatever, but it, it, it can't continue to go up at that sort of pace unless it just Pac-Man's the whole world, the whole stock market. Um, but if you want to, like, there could be some sort of camaraderie there or feeling part of the team that you want to keep some of your Apple shares and keep some of those stock options. I'm fine with that. Again, just pick, pick the amount that's going to allow you to balance the, I know I'm diversified, but I also have this piece here that keeps me involved and it's 5%, 10%, 20%, whatever it is. I think that's fine. It's okay to give yourself a little bit there. You don't have to, you know, be so hard lined on this stuff. Do you think, does this change down the line? I feel like a lot of these tech companies just give out astronomical amounts of, of stock in their, their companies to their employees. Like it seems no, like I, it's become monopoly money at this point. Well, no, that, that Apple stock still, uh, still spends right. But but they also they're buying back a ton of their shares. No, no, no. So I mean I mean to out. the company. It's like they it just seems like they give out you know insane amounts of of the company basically uh, you know huge huge amounts. Well, of think about companies. it. It's 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 probably saves them in the end, especially if the stock goes up because they're not paying out cash bonuses. Probably tax advantage too, or something. I'm yeah, sure. So yeah. It, and yeah, if, if the stock went down, God forbid if it ever happened, then then it's not as much of a cost to them. So I I think yeah I think it's a way to cut it. Plus the you have to stay there for a long enough time for it to vest so it keeps people staying there to work longer um yeah that makes sense but yeah congrats on the dream job i just figure out a, a set amount that you want to keep and then rebalance around that that set amount that's the easiest way to do this david wilson in the chat said imagine uh having worked for blackberry Oof. But, uh, a great movie as as uh we've discussed recently but uh it was good yeah. I, th I looked the other day it went from 82 dollars to three dollars or something i think the stock that's, yeah that's rough all right Next one. Okay. Tons of questions on insurance lately. Yeah, lots of these. Uh, okay, so this one's from Michael. My wife and I got married and then decided to sit down with a financial advisor that works for the same company that manages our 401k. The first thing the advisor tried to do was get us involved in life insurance. It seemed like a sales pitch, and from that moment on, it felt like his main objective was to line his pockets and sell us something. I told him that I already had a whole life policy, was I wrong to think they should have tried to analyze our financial situation and provide us with opinions to improve our financial situation? All right, let's bring our in-house in insurance expert, Andrew Hills Wealth, Jonathan Novi. Hey, Jonathan. Jonathan, hey, the insurance industry is not only runs in you, it runs in your family, right? Your father's been doing this forever as well, right? Yeah, my, uh, my dad started in the late 1960s, generally on the group health insurance side, uh, evolved into a life insurance guy, an advisor, much like we are, but he focused more on group health and also life insurance. So, I mean, I didn't come into it right away. I ended up working with him a little bit, started at an insurance company broker dealer where he still is, still working at 84, uh, like most people in that business are. But yeah, Brian, our colleague here, and I started at an insurance company broker dealer with him. Um, learned no fire for your father then. He's yeah. Gonna... <laughs> no, uh, we learned pretty quickly that uh, an insurance company broker dealer is a terrible place to be a fiduciary. So we got out of there as quickly as we could. Well, I think that's, that's what this that's what this question is getting into. And right. th this is you could take insurance out of this question completely, regardless of what kind of strategy or plan someone is pitching. They should always analyze your financial situation. We always tell people, listen, we can't tell you how to invest your portfolio until we understand your circumstances and your personality and your emotional makeup and all this stuff. You can't give someone advice. You can't prescribe something without diagnosing first. No, you cannot. And, and he says here, it seemed like a sales pitch. It's because it was a sales pitch. So it's very accurate. You've, you've judged well what was going on. Uh, the thing about insurance, and we say this all the time, and this is the first line that we use when we talk to anyone who's asking us about it. People buy insurance primarily for one reason. It's because there will be a financial impact on their family 
were they to die or be disabled or need long-term care or have what's known as a low probability, high impact event. The job as an advisor is to actually measure what that financial impact will be. And if you can insure it and it's affordable, then you do. But no insurance decision should be made outside the context of somebody's individual financial plan. So right. it's Michael here asking this question is correct. If someone was supposed to be building a financial plan for him, then any recommendation on insurance should be a part of that plan, but should not be the only thing that the individual is talking about. It's not- right. there, the insurance, insurance might be part of this financial plan depending on their needs mm -hmm. or the risks they need to figure out, but you can't just say, here's insurance, this is it, without understanding what those risks are first. Right. Nobody needs insurance. Nobody does. However, insurance is just a tool that people use to manage risks that they would like to manage. Sometimes it's the best thing for someone to use. Oftentimes it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, like I said, you have to figure out if there's a financial impact on your family or your business if you die or are disabled. And if there's no financial impact as a result of your death or disability or whatever, then don't buy insurance. Uh, now there are still reasons beyond that and they're limited that someone may want to own uh, generally permanent insurance. Um, and we well, can get, get a little let, more into Duncan, that. do the next question. Let's do the next question and get into some actual examples here. Okay. So up next, we have a question from Sean. I'm 42, married with no kids, uh, $900,000 in mostly stock holdings divided between a Vanguard advisor managed account, an IRA, and a trading account. I make about $200,000 a year. A life insurance broker has been contacting me, pitching both term and whole life insurance. I'm averse to the idea of term life insurance since my wife would get our assets upon my passing anyway, and she doesn't plan to retire and need any income uh, for another 25 years. By then, our holdings will have grown and should be a substantial amount to retire on anyway. That leaves whole life as an option. Uh, there's an accrual of principal and a cash amount that can be enjoyed later in life during retirement. This seems very much like what I'm already doing and does not necessitate me committing to a whole life policy with whatever fees are embedded. Does whole life or term life insurance make sense for me or anyone in a similar position to me? Many thanks and keep up the great work. All right, so I can probably explain term because it's basically you pick it. So 10 to 30 years or something is probably the, the term that you can get. And you have that long of a time for your, I, I think my first term was 15 years when I first had my first child. So that one's pretty easy. And that's, that's usually the default for most people. So maybe you can explain what whole life is and when that sort of thing makes sense for someone to consider. Sure. So life insurance is what we're talking about here. It breaks down into term insurance, which you've talked about and permanent life insurance. People tend to think that all permanent insurance is whole life. But if you drew one of those Venn diagrams that are kind of popular in our business, whole life goes into the circle that is permanent life insurance, meaning the kind that you're going to have for the rest of your life or much longer than you would get for a term contract, which is typically, like you said, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. There's also something called the annual renewable term, which you get to just buy every year. Um, most insurance needs are for simple term insurance. The reason for that goes back to what I said a second ago, because you measure what the financial impact will be on your family or business were you to die. That impact- Right, you die, goes, there's a payout. Right, and that the impact of a death goes away generally when a person's older, when they are no longer earning. So if someone no longer has an income, then what would a family, and I'm not here talking about how it doesn't suck when people die because it does, but we're talking about insurance. So there's the financial thing that we're trying to figure out. If no one suffers financially as a result of your death, then you do not need insurance. Yeah, that's what someone actually asked in the, in the chat. They said, what does my net worth have to be to just completely do away with life insurance? And your point is, could you live on whatever assets you have? Exactly. So let's talk could about. It, could it be an emotional hedge though? Like uh, Duncan died, but hey, look, I get one hundred fifty thousand dollars. It you could know? be. That, so that's a reason for someone to own it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's all just as irresponsible as it might be to say always buy term and invest the difference. Um, it's irresponsible to say that that permanent life insurance isn't 
sometimes appropriate. But I'll tell you what it's not. Permanent life insurance, whether it's whole life or whether it's variable universal life, which is the kind of thing where you invest cash values inside things like mutual funds. Whole life or variable life or indexed UL or you name it, these are not good investments for the purpose of, of using money later in your life. Right, like compounding your wealth. They're people always say like, hey, I can, for people that. always say that, people always pitch them as, I can borrow against them or I can take the money out and it's, it's not gonna crash like the stock market. So people use them as That's, a way to kind of scare you into putting your money into them in a lot of right. ways. They say things like, oh, this is your safe money. What are you gonna do with your aggressive money? It's, these are terrible investments for the purpose of accruing cash because the costs in them are massive. Were someone to have a very, very, very long time horizon, then you might be able to benefit from the tax treatment of the cash values in insurance. So the thing about insurance that is sold all the time is that cash values, when invested in an insurance policy, they have a favorable relationship to the tax code in that they grow tax deferred. And if you access those cash values properly, you First, you take withdrawals from the contract and then you borrow from the contract and those withdrawals or those loans are not taxable to you. Now, there's boxes you got to tick along the way to make sure that you do it Is that it just because you're taking back your own money in some instances? or how? Well, when it's return of uh, basis, yes. But then the borrowing, the tax code says it's not, um, uh, it's not constructive receipt of income, meaning you just don't get taxed on it. But over short periods of time, and 25 years is a short period of time for something like this, these contracts just never work the way that they are illustrated, ever. And the costs are massive. So who, so what, give me an example of a time when, not that it would be the best option, but it would be a option that makes sense for someone to invest, okay. to put their money in something like this. Uh, here's a couple different examples. Um, first, used to be that people had defined benefit pension plans wherein they would retire and then the company they worked for would pay them an income, a pension benefit, rather than have a 401k plan. If that pension benefit would go away with an individual's passing and that pension benefit had to support, let's say, a spouse afterwards, then the death of that individual, if that person died early, would be, have a financial impact on a surviving spouse. So the thing to do would be to buy life insurance. So you could replace the money that was delivering that pension. Right. This, we still do this now. There's plenty of things like public sector employees that have pensions. Um, now, you, there's a ton of detail that goes into stuff like this. And again, all of these decisions should be made within the context of someone's individual financial plan. But that's one. Uh, here's another one. And this is, it's becoming a bigger deal when the current tax code sunsets at the end of 2025. People buy permanent insurance for the purpose of estate liquidity. Very wealthy people tend to own insurance because they will be faced with a transfer tax, a federal estate tax, and sometimes a state estate tax upon their death. And what they don't want to have to do is liquidate assets. You take families, as an example, that own significant amounts of real estate. We're talking about very wealthy families here. I mean, this is a niche thing. But very wealthy families who have assets they don't want to sell are going to pay taxes. I think that's a, that's a good point, is that a lot of times these vehicles only make sense for niche circumstances. Yeah. So for families that are going to face tax liabilities like this, you can fund these tax liabilities with insurance. It's a fantastic way to do it. And if you do it properly, I mean, there's a lot of estate planning involved and stuff like that. And, and for estate liquidity questions, if you do it uh, you can insure two, two people at the same time, a husband and a wife, it's what's known as a second to die or a survivorship contract. The leverage on those is really good. So we talk about this all the time with our wealthier clients. Uh, another time that permanent life insurance is reasonable is that if an individual or a family has a legacy goal and they simply want to make sure to leave money to whether it's children or grandchildren, or you name it. Insurance can put a floor underneath a wealth transfer objective. It is the soundest way, the least risky way, to transfer money to a following generation. Yeah, that makes sense.
and it allows people. So as an example, some, it, you, now that we have some yield in the world again, people can do things like live off the yield on their portfolio a little bit. But it used to be that they couldn't do that when rates were you know, zero. Uh, but if you can say to an individual, you know, you have the competing goals of wanting to live the life you want to live in your retirement, but also want to leave something to your beneficiaries. If those goals are conflicting, then they say to themselves, well, I don't want to spend all my money. Well, how about this? Spend every dollar you have, but make sure one of the things you fund in your lifetime is permanent life insurance, and then you can decide how much money you want to leave to your beneficiaries. Yep. It's a much more compartmentalized, simple way of addressing a legacy objective for someone. Well, good lead. Duncan, read the last question, because I think this is kind of ties into this, the hierarchy thing of insurance. Okay, so uh, last but not least, we have a question from AJ. I've been speaking to a financial consultant about investment opportunities. They are really pushing for in insurance as an investment. Can you speak to how insurance works as an investment vehicle and where it ranks in the investment hierarchy? So based on what we've been talking about already, it, it seems like it comes pretty far down as far as investment vehicles goes and, and all the different ways that you can buy financial assets. Yes, it's last on the investment vehicle um, hierarchy or totem pole. I do want to say one thing about this. I giggled when I saw the question because they used the term financial consultant. Back in my former life- I was gonna ask about that. Life, I, didn't know, I didn't know what that meant. Okay, so back in my former life at the insurance company broker dealer, compliance there was really reluctant to allow people to call themselves advisors because they're not, they're product salesmen. Uh, so they would say things like, put financial consultant on your business card as if it gives the person selling that garbage some sort of gravitas. There is some more cachet there. Oh, total cachet. It's just, it's crap though. Imagine because, if they put senior in front of that, you know? Oh my God. It's like, I could very happily put chief bad ombre on my business card, but it doesn't mean that I'm tough. Like just because somebody puts financial consultant on their business card doesn't mean they're in any way consultative. So, uh, so with this, um, that person is not a consultant. That person is not an advisor. They're an insurance salesman. That's it. So, um, well, maybe we can, I, not without completely dunking on the insurance industry, maybe we can just talk about a little bit of the incentives in a lot of these products for why they get pitched. Cause we do see these questions a lot saying, right. this person is pitching me insurance and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was going to be my, my question kind of is knowing I'm the overly and leveraged ETFs guy. I've, I have spent zero time thinking about insurance. Yeah, you're the opposite. What, yeah, what, <laughs> I'm, what I'm confused by is if these are like worthwhile, good products for people, then why do they need so many salespeople pushing them so hard? That's what I just kind of always am a little thrown off by. Uh, the products are not the problem. Insurance products are just products like other financial products out there. Right. To the your point, there, there are use cases for them. There, there absolutely are times there are. when they make sense. Look, annuities aren't all bad. Annuities can be fantastic. Permanent life insurance is not all bad. It can be the right thing for people. But the incentives that are built into the insurance industry are the worst incentives in financial services because they come with really big upfront or what's called heaped commissions. And if you got rid of heaped commissions, not that many people would be there to sell them. So like, I have no issue with insurance carriers. Right, you're, and insurance taking, you're taking the products. payment on that all up front, right? The fee is basically being earned up front. Generally speaking, yes. It depends on, there are some insurance products where it's not, but generally speaking, yes. Um, insurance products are great. I mean, talk to someone whose family owns long term care and they're making a claim on it. It's literally the most valuable thing they have. Talk to someone whose family owned life insurance and needed it. This stuff exists for a reason, but the utterly perverse and awful incentive structures that go into the sale are what make it so difficult to deal with insurance people. Right. Uh, it's and that's it's very reasons... circumstantial. It's not for everyone. That's, that's the takeaway. Right. You, like I said, if you take anything away from this conversation about insurance, it's make sure that any recommendation you're getting is simply grounded in a financial plan because right. it has to be to fit and your if, circumstances, not in investment products. Mm -hmm. And it, and make sure it's simply, tied to Bitcoin. Yes. Right. You want to make sure the insurance carrier invests their reserves in Solana. <laughs> All right. This, this has been very helpful. Again, I think once a week we get a term versus whole life question. And so I, I think it, it is making, and I think that's, 
that's why most people say I'm, I've been told to default to term. I don't know why. I think this gives people a better sense of, of why that is the case. It's very confusing. I saw people in the chat, you know, like this, yeah, this is, it's always very confusing to hear about whole versus term, all this, yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was helpful. Generally, term think, insurance is the right thing for people. Yeah, and, and I think that there's, there's there's more resources available for other investment products, and I think it's it's just sort of complex, and it's not as easy to understand the insurance stuff because there is you know a lot more that goes into it. So this was helpful. Thank you to Jonathan. We appreciate it. He holds down the insurance for us at it holds wealth. Uh, thank you to Duncan again for wearing a hat. Thanks to me for wearing a nice straight sweater. It and, is a nice sweater. Yeah. Uh, email us ask the compound show at gmail.com. Thanks to everyone in the live chat as always. Man, they brought the insurance questions this week. Yeah. Everyone was very engaged. Leave us a comment on YouTube, like, subscribe, all that stuff, and we'll see you next time. See you everyone. See you guys.